to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read a passage from there in just a minute. If you are visiting with us, we are glad you are here. This is what we're about to do, partaking of the Lord's Supper, remembering Jesus' sacrifice for us, is the heartbeat of who we are as followers of Jesus, and it's the heartbeat of what we do here as a family. So we are thankful that you're here with us, joining with us in this. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 13 and read the rest of the chapter, and then we're going to pray that God would bless our time together this morning. It says there in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of the two so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to you who are near. For through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, we pray now that you would meet us here However, we might be coming to the table this morning, meet us here and show us the life-changing reality of your son's death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. Bless us now as we think about your word and help all of this to be to your glory. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to have a little bit of audience participation to start this morning. So if you would, I would like for you to take a deep breath. All right, pretty good. Some of you are a little slow on the uptake, so we'll do it again. This time, I want you to inhale deeply and exhale fully. Go ahead. There we go. It was a little louder that time. All right, one more time. Take a deep breath. Now, bring to mind a place where that comes naturally for you. A place where your breathing deepens and eases, and your breathing can reflect peace. Every year growing up, I watched my parents' breathing deepen and ease as we pulled into Townsend, Tennessee on Lamar Alexander Parkway every year. If you're not familiar, Townsend is a small town right on the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It's this small town. It's like 20 minutes from Cades Cove, if you're familiar with the Smokies. And every time my parents' breathing would ease because Townsend touts itself as the peaceful side of the Smokies. Now, this is, this is the kind of place that's small, it's warm, it's welcoming, it's lovely. There are several campgrounds where you can stay. There are fun local restaurants to go to. There is a great, like a fantastic coffee shop if you're ever in the area and need a recommendation. The little river that runs through the Smokies is always within earshot. It is, this is where it gets a little offensive to those of you who go to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. It is the better version of the Smokies than Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge because it's a foil that, you know, Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge, the hustle and bustle and all the tourist traps. There's a Titanic in the middle of Pigeon Forge. 
In Townsend, it's different. It's slower, it's quieter, and it is right there next to the, natu- the national park. Every year when we pulled in, I can remember that subtle rubberized crack of the windows as the windows rolled down in our van. And every time I could see it from the back seat and I could hear it, a deep breath from both of my parents. And what they were experiencing and what I knew for them was that a restful, restorative vacation had begun. We almost naturally into it that something good, healthy happens when we breathe deeply. Think of the different settings where you might tell someone to take a deep breath before they're about to play in a big game or take a big test. When someone is especially angry or anxious, when your kid just really needs to refocus or when you need to concentrate, we tell people, take a deep breath. Because again, we think that something good is going to come from it. But what's interesting is that there is a whole, not field, but there is a plethora of research that bears out this intuition is absolutely true. Something good happens when our breathing deepens and eases. There was a 2020 study out of Yale that studied just the day-to-day experiences of university students over the course of eight weeks. At the beginning of this study, the students were taught deep breathing techniques and were given a schedule for implementing them throughout their day-to-day. What the researchers found at the end of the study was that the deep breathing techniques were correlated with decreased feelings of depression, increased stress management ability, increased what's called positive affect, which just means they felt better, and an increased sense of social connectedness, just implementing deep breathing in their day to day. There was also a breakthrough study, a really important study in 2002 out of the University of Quebec and University of Louvain that showed our breathing, deep breathing, doesn't just reflect our emotional experience, it can actually generate emotional experience as well. So here's maybe the easiest example. I might be feeling particularly anxious in a given moment. But if my breathing pattern reflects serenity, there's a good chance that my mind and my body will follow suit. So in moments of heightened emotions, deep breathing is helpful. And then a 2014 study out of the University of Wisconsin taught and studied veterans over the course of a year who were experiencing PTSD. And they found that teaching deep breathing techniques to those veterans could lessen the effects of triggers that brought about an awareness of their PTSD. So again, let's summarize and generalize these studies. In our day-to-day, in those moments of intense emotional experience, And in the processing of deep trauma and even grief, something good happens when we can slow down and breathe deeply. Here's why we bring all this up. This place, the table, this is maybe the place where followers of Jesus can breathe deeply. This is the place where we find peace, where we find the restful, restorative presence of our Savior. And then from that, a whole host of good will flow. 
But here's what we need to recognize, even in saying something like that. There is a chance that you are dealing with a certain challenge or are experiencing a certain heart posture that might prevent you on a week-to-week basis from fully experiencing the peace that this table can provide. We know anxiety is a major issue in our society. And you might be here this morning in an anxious season of life with your mind racing. Or you might be in a season of life where you are struggling with sin. Some particular vice has your heart gripped and you might be sitting here worried that at any moment it feels like your duplicity might be found out. Or you might be sitting here lonely, surrounded by others, but feeling disconnected from God and from your church family. What we see in Ephesians 2 is that Jesus meets these different challenges head on in a way that brings us peace, in a way that can deepen and ease our breathing. And so quickly, I just want to point out two ideas that Paul is showing us here in Ephesians 2 to hopefully help us collectively draw a deeper breath. Number one is that Jesus brings us near to God. Jesus brings us near to God. At the beginning of chapter 2, Paul describes sinful humanity as dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Dead in our trespasses and sins. But then he says, but in Christ, God made us alive and raised us up with him and seated us with Christ in heavenly places. So what Paul wants us to hear is that at one time, we were as far removed from God as death is from life itself. But now, in Christ, we are seated with God. It's where we belong. Or later on, the second half of Ephesians 2 Paul says that we were strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and completely without God in the world. But in Christ, he says, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You've been brought near. You have been brought into close proximity with God by the blood of Christ, which means as we come here each week and remember Jesus' sacrifice for us, at least part of what we are remembering is that we have been brought into very near proximity to God. But secondly, and I think this is, this is the idea that has been so helpful for me since we've started this Lord's Supper service. This transition that Paul talks about, this miracle of going from death to life, from being far removed to God to seated with him in the heavenly places. This experience of salvation always happens within community. It always happens within community. And specifically, what we see in chapter 2 here in Ephesians is we see that it happens within a culture-transcending community. Here's what we know. We know, and we have all experienced, that our society right now is dangerously polarized. We are divided. Research suggests that we are so polarized and divided, it has seeped so far into our psyches that we are suspicious now of our neighbors, the people next door. We might even be suspicious of family members and even church family who might disagree with us on any number of issues. And in a moment of honesty, I think we would all admit That divisiveness is exhausting. 
It can take the life from us. It can take the breath from our lungs. But the message of the cross is crystal clear. Brothers and sisters, that is not us. That is not us. We are not participants or perpetuators of that divisiveness that we're seeing in society. That divisiveness cannot survive full participation at this table. At the cross of Christ, divisions were broken. Here's what Paul says. He says, Jesus is our peace who has made Jews and Gentiles one and has broken in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility that he might create in himself one new humanity so making peace. There is no political, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, or generational divide that the cross of Christ has not fully handled. And so ours is to walk in that peace, to walk in that wholeness, that real community that explodes forth into our lives from our participation here at the table. Ours is to experience what Robert Mulholland described as life-giving healing and redemptive community with others. So as we move to the table this morning, we can breathe deeply knowing that we are in the very near presence of our God. And we are there along with a life-giving, beautiful community that is called to transcend the exhaustion of the world. This place near our God, along with that life-giving community, this is where we belong. So as we eat and drink this morning, I wanna encourage you to bring yourself fully into the presence of your God. Acknowledge that loneliness those sins, those feelings of anxiety, and in doing so, proclaim your belief, whatever little faith you might have, proclaim your belief that the cross of Christ has handled them. And in so doing, I think we all might find that we can breathe just a little deeper. We'd ask the men to come forward now in service.